Nelson from Nelson Elder Care Law, and I appreciate you jumping on our live today. Just like every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we want to be able to go live and bring you great information about things that we feel are important to you. We're always open to new topic suggestions, but today is one that's really close to my heart. What we're talking about today is VA benefits and how it affects seniors. We all know that a lot of the generation right now is going through different care issues, getting ready to think about what things like assisted livings, in-home care, and even eventually nursing homes, what they cost and how do we offset some of those costs. If we have somebody still living at home, what options are available for them to get some care, especially for veterans that don't have full retirement. We know that things like TRICARE that a lot of us have heard of is an amazing, amazing Medicare substitute for retired veterans that covers a lot of really great prescriptions and medical care. But whenever we start talking about the long-term care piece of that, what does it look like? What do we need to think about whenever we have loved ones or family that has served in the military, may have been told previously that they don't qualify for certain benefits, and now they're getting to a stage in their life where they might. And so we want to talk about a couple different kinds of benefits today, and we don't want it to be too confusing, so we're going to break it down into chunks. But one of the things I want you to remember through this entire process is here at Nelson Elder Care Law, all of our attorneys are VA accredited, which means that we've actually received certification from the Veterans Affairs Department to make sure that we can help you. One of the other really, really key parts whenever you're working with anything for veterans is you have to understand that because the amount of money that certain veterans can get is pretty substantial, there's a lot of scams out there. So the first and most primary thing I want you to think about whenever we're going through today is you should not be paying anyone to help you get benefits, anybody that promises to get you benefits, anybody that says they're going to charge you to complete an application for benefits. Those are all essentially scams. It is unethical and illegal in most cases to charge veterans to help them get benefits, especially on a case of first impression. So if somebody hasn't received a denial letter, it's almost always illegal for somebody to charge you. And so whenever you hear those companies out there with the very American sounding names, such as Patriot Angels, and things along that line, a lot of um, brochures with flags and eagles and great service people on them, we want to keep in mind that somehow those people are getting paid. A lot of financial advisors out there get licensed just to sell annuities. And again, just like in some of our other series, we want to make sure that you guys are aware Anytime that we're talking about financial instruments like annuities or paying people to help get a benefit, you really need to have clear and precise questions about what you're charging for, what you're actually getting for those results, and whether or not it's even ethical and legal. And with a lot of those companies, you'll find out that they fall apart real quick whenever you start digging. So let's go ahead and jump on in and kind of talk about the main three areas of veteran benefits for seniors. Again, we're not talking about People that have served for 20 years and gotten full retirement, that's a whole different section and we just don't have enough time to cover that today. What we're talking about is what's called pension. Not full retirement, but pension and specifically disability pension. There's two main umbrellas of that. The first one is what's called service connected. This was somebody who has lost their hearing due to being on the flight deck of a carrier this is somebody who has maybe shrapnel still in them because of something that's happened to them during their service. And they have ongoing medical issues that can be directly related to those injuries. A lot of times you'll see this expressed as a percentage. So sometimes it's a 10% disability rating for hearing. Sometimes it's a 20, 30, 40% disability rating for something with mobility. And it can go all the way up to 100% what they call service-connected disability. There's a magic number of 100% service-connected disability because if your spouse or your parent has the 100% rating on a service-connected disability, often, even whenever they pass, those benefits can carry on. Anything short of 100% service-connected disability generally is going to pass with the veteran themselves whenever they pass. It's a huge benefit and often has really, really high monthly payouts depending on when the veteran served and what their rank was during that service. So whenever you start seeing benefits in the six, seven, eight thousand dollar range, that's whenever we're talking about a hundred percent service connected disability. Most of the people that we work with 
because they're seniors and because they served many years ago, if they have a service-connected disability like that, they're already going through that process. They already have their benefits. Generally, a service-connected disability is going to be something that you work with with a VA social worker. They actually have an entire team of case managers and social workers. You usually have to be seen by a VA doctor. In Georgia here, that's going to generally be over at the Decatur campus. You're going to go in person, make sure that you set an appointment to do that, and they'll walk you through how to qualify for service-connected. Most service-connected claims are denied the first time around. That's pretty standard. It's hard to find an attorney that will help you walk through the first round of your service-connected claim because it is illegal to charge, again, for any kind of help with completing that claim. What you'll see is that for service-connected disability, where an attorney gets involved is whenever you get that first denial, you need to reach out to somebody that's got your back, somebody that can walk you through the steps on how you can get that reevaluated or appealed in order to be able to get your claim processed again and hopefully get a higher rating. Even if you have a rating of a service-connected disability, a lot of our seniors right now have service-connected for hearing, which is only 10 to 20% disability, which is often a pretty low amount on a monthly stipend, where before we were talking about 100% disability being in the 6,000 plus range, a 10% hearing disability is often only a few hundred dollars. It still helps, but there's usually a lot more opportunity. One of the big pitfalls that you wanna look for whenever you're thinking about making a service-connected appeal or a review is that there is a big difference between an actual appeal versus just another review. One of the carrot versus sticks that the VA uses in order to keep people from just continuously reapplying and appealing their decision is that although the number or the percentage of disability can go up, they also reserve the right to move it down. So usually once people start getting into about a 30 to 40% disability rating, unless they have substantial mobility issues or they really have a strong case, they usually are too fearful to take that on further in fear that they're gonna lose their 40 or 50% down to another 10%. And so it's really important that you work with your social worker, work with your case manager, but if you feel like you do have something that you're not getting heard, reach out to an attorney that handles that specific service-connected disability, and they don't get paid up front, they get paid as a percentage whenever you collect, so it doesn't mean you're gonna come out of pocket for anything. It's again, the VA has some amazing, amazing programs, but the problem that we run into is that access to those programs is the biggest pitfall. If you have service-connected disability, you probably know it because you were injured during your service. Most people that are aware that they can qualify for service-connected disability really are aware of it. But one of the big sections of pension that most people aren't aware of it, even the VA only estimates that somewhere between 5 to 15% of people that are eligible for this benefit, even though it exists, is what's called non-service connected disability, otherwise called improved pension. Sometimes you'll hear it by the slang term aid in attendance. It's mixed and commingled in with a status called housebound. And as you can see already, just before we do the introduction to it, because it has so many variations and so many names, there's a lot of misinformation out of it. What we run into often is a veteran who may be in their 60s, 70s, sometimes even all the way up to their late 90s, and they're struggling with some kind of illness or medical care that came on not because of their service for their country, but because of their age, because of something that happened afterwards, because of a stroke, a fall, anything along those lines that has changed it so that they now need help with what are called activities of daily living. So whenever we start talking about activities of daily living, they're pretty standard across the board for things like long-term care insurance, but the VA even expands upon those. Whenever we start talking about the first part, it's saying things like hygiene. Do you need help showering? Do you need help toileting, going to the bathroom? Do you need help getting dressed? Do you need help eating? Do you need help with your vision? Those are the things that we think of whenever we think common activities of daily living, but the VA even expands that further because they know that there's a big difference between can you eat versus can you prepare your meals. Preparing meals is a lower standard, but luckily it's one the VA allows you to use. It's called an intermediate activity of daily living. Otherwise, you'll see that abbreviated as IADL. 
whenever we start talking about some of these IADLs, it's really important to think about things like medication management. Often whenever we have somebody that's first hearing about this benefit, they aren't at the point where they need around the clock care. That's not what we're talking about. Usually people that want to trigger this benefit are just now starting to have some troubles. They're starting to look into things like in-home care, a caregiver coming into their house. Sometimes that can be a family member. It can't be your spouse, but we'll talk about what the qualifications for their, that are in a little bit. But if it's somebody like a caregiver coming in, they often get some sticker shock about what that costs. For a licensed and bonded caregiver in Georgia, the average cost is $23 to $26 an hour, and they usually have minimums somewhere around three to four hours. So pretty much if we round that off, we know that anybody coming out is getting paid at least 100 bucks each time. If they're coming out even once a day for that minimum amount of time, all of a sudden we're looking at five to $700 a week. We know that there's over four weeks in most months, but let's just go ahead and use that. And so we know that real quickly we get above $2,000 a month in caregiving costs. And that's why we're still at home. We still have things like mortgages, possibly property taxes, utilities, prescriptions, food. None of that's been discounted. We've just added to the budget requirements by adding caregivers. And that's what makes this non-service connected pension so great is for a married couple, they can end up getting a benefit of over $2,200 a month. If it is just a single veteran themselves, they can get over $1,900 a month. And if it's a surviving spouse, so somebody that was married to a veteran at the time of their death, and that veteran meets the other service requirements, they can still get over $1,200 a month. Now, I know we talked about that $2,000 a month caregiving cost, and so it doesn't cover all those depending on the circumstances of the family. But it does take a huge hit towards making that budget shortfall exceptionally smaller. And that's really important whenever we talk about these being long-term care issues that go on for pretty much the life of an individual. We want to make sure that whenever somebody has the opportunity to get these benefits, they trigger them as quickly as possible because they do go for the veteran's life or their surviving spouse's life, as long as they're paying for care. In order to qualify for the VA improved pension, again, you don't have to trace back your disability towards any kind of service connected issue, but you do have to need help with those activities of daily living, at least two of them, and you have to be paying someone for care. In order to get the maximum amounts, you need to be paying more than what a certain number that the VA kind of establishes as far as income availability. This is individualized to each person, but for most people, whenever they do the math, it ends up saying that in order to get the full amounts, you have to pay more than your income to get that care. For some families, that's really easy. The average social security amount for a couple is only about $2,500 a month. And as you can see, just with having somebody come in for the minimum a few days a week, we can easily surpass that amount. Whenever we start talking about somebody transitioning away from their home into an assisted living with an average cost north of $3,500 to $5,000 a month, you can see that we easily exceed most people's income, especially whenever we start talking about things like memory care, where that cost is normally over $6,000 a month. Most people in their retirement don't have that kind of income coming in, and so the VA is a great helper to offset that budget shortfall and extend the length of assets so that we don't run out of money or we don't feel like we're having that cash crunch. One of the most uncomfortable conversations for most parents is having to go to their family or their siblings and ask for some kind of resource to help cover their costs. Nobody wants to be a burden. And that's one of the biggest things that we see whenever people age and have these ongoing care costs is a fear to get the care they need because they don't want to ask. It's really important that whenever our seniors feel like they're drowning, that they also feel like they can ask for help. One of the ways that they can ask for help is through this benefit. If we take an example of a single veteran who is eligible for over $1,900 a month based on their service during a wartime period, maybe has an income of around $2,000, but they're moving into an assisted living that costs $3,500, they can actually receive the full $1,911 a month from the VA, which is a tax-free payment. So it's like getting more whenever you were working. Remember that whenever you get paychecks, you have Medicare taken out, Social Security taken out, 
all those fun deductions that drop it down so you aren't really seeing the full amount. With this, they're really going to direct deposit $19.11 a month into this gentleman's account. You'll notice that with his $2,000 of income, as well as his $19.11 from the VA, he now has total income of over $3,900 a month. And if his assisted living cost is only $3,500, he still has income exceeding his cost total. But because his actual income, aside from the VA benefits, is less than what his care costs are, he's going to receive that full amount. Otherwise, there is a dollar-for-dollar dollar deduction based on the difference between the care costs and income. Some people we find that have great dual pensions, especially whenever they're employed by the state or federal government, they might have some pensions that are pretty substantial, maybe in that five dollars to $6,000 range. And in that case, this benefit doesn't kick in as well unless something happens to both spouses or we're talking about cognitive impairment. Remember that memory care is often north of $5,500 to $6,500 a month. So even if somebody has a really, really strong federal pension of $5,000 a month, this benefit's still a great help. Whenever we start talking about what thresholds we have to meet for this, remember the keys that we look for are that it has to be a veteran that needs help with activities of daily living, is paying for care, usually somewhere around in excess of their income, but it can vary a little bit per family. And then ever since October of 2018, the VA had changed some rules that make it so that we have an income and asset number commingled together that has to be under $129,000. So if you have a great savings in your brokerage account, you have a couple CDs, you don't qualify for this if you have $200,000. You have to plan ahead in order to be able to do that. So in October of 2018, the VA implemented what they called a look back period. And so what that means is that if you have, let's say $250,000 to your name, and you have to get that below 129,000, you can't just gift away the money. What would happen before is often financial advisors would use things such as a single premium immediate annuity, sometimes called a SPIA, sometimes you'd hear it called a Medicaid or a VA annuity, to take a big chunk of assets like that and transfer it so that you wouldn't have to claim it as zonery. Whenever that happened, that would make people immediately eligible the next month. The VA for the last really 10 years has been wise to this strip but never done anything about it until October of 18. What they said was we're going to look back 36 months and any kind of transfers that we've done for less than value or any of these financial instrument tricks that people like to use prior to this date, they're going to put a stop to it. And so what they've done is say that not only are we going to look back three years for these transfers, but if you've done these transfers, we're going to penalize you for up to five years going forward. That's pretty harsh. It's actually even more harsh than the way that Medicaid treats things. And so whenever we think about Medicaid, remember we did a series where you don't have to be broke, but that's the way people intend that program to be. And so for the VA to come out and be even more strict on that, I think is a real misstep. These veterans are all wartime veterans. They served their country, they did their duty. And so I think we need to make access to these programs a little easier. But because that's above my pay grade, we got to work in the system that they have right now. And so what we're able to do is move things around with the use of what's called a Veterans Asset Protection Trust and different planning that we can do for people that do have more than $129,000. One of the biggest pitfalls that we see most people that try and do these claims on their own fall into is that the VA's definition of net worth and the general public's definition of net worth are substantially different. For most people, if you ask them what their net worth was, they would take things like their assets, subtract their debts from it, and end up with their net worth. The VA does it a very, very different way. They take your assets, add in your income annually, and that is your net worth for VA purposes. You'll notice that unfortunately, we weren't able to exclude debts like credit cards, medical bills, aside from certain ones that are ongoing, different personal loans, 
auto loans, things like that, we aren't allowed to take that away from your net worth. And anybody else in a financial industry would say that's not a true definition of net worth. And that's a real turmoil for a lot of people whenever they're trying to go through this for their family is because if you read a word that everybody in the world pretty much has a standard definition of and they're going to define it differently, it's an opportunity for you to have a misstep. And because that penalty, remember, can go forward for years, you want to make sure this is done right. Whenever this is done right, it can actually result in huge benefits for your family. Right now, we're going to share a link to what we call the VA Backlog Tracker. And unfortunately, you'll see that during the pandemic, the VA has been having a lot of the problems that a lot of other federal programs have had. And they actually have over 200,000 backlog claims right now. This is pretty devastating because remember that the people that need this program are people that have some kind of disability and ongoing care costs that they need to pay for, and they have some kind of limitation on their assets. It's really important that these people get the cash flow that they need in order to keep going through the process and get the care that they deserve. Because of this backlog, we estimate that the claims put in, such as today, will take at least six to nine months to be processed, and we would not be surprised if we have year-long processing periods for the claims that are entered during this pandemic period. The VA is luckily back in processing claims for many months from around March till July. They were very limited on what they were pushing through. Since July, they've opened back up for the most part, and they're still getting things handled, but it's slow process compared to what it used to be. We highly, highly suggest that if you or your loved one anticipate needing to have in-home care, assisted living, those kind of care changes in the near future, that you go ahead and give us a call to be able to talk about your specific situations and walk you through whether or not now is the time to trigger those. There's a lot of things that we can do to help you trigger the benefit early. So even if you're thinking maybe once assisted living's open back up and there's more visitations and it's a little bit more like the environment pre-COVID, that that's something where you or your spouse want to go to or your loved one needs that kind of care, maybe we go ahead and set it up so that we can put in the claim already, get that nine month to a year process started, and then that way you aren't hitting any kind of cash crunches whenever you do actually make that care transition. A good question that always gets asked is, like we talked about for the service-connected disability, when and when do you not need an attorney? For the non-service-connected disability, the line in the sand really is, if you own a home, you need to protect it. So you probably need to work with an attorney on that. The VA excludes the value of the home for application purposes but has a weird rule where if that home is ever rented, the income counts towards the, they call income for VA purposes, or if the house is ever sold, it can usually kick most people off of benefits because the equity in most seniors' home is going to put them over that $129,000 threshold whenever it goes from an exempt asset to countable. We can structure it in a way so that this doesn't cause the same issues whenever you just sell your home. The other thing is if you do have more than $129,000, or you have some questions about how we trigger the benefit earlier by using things as caregiver agreements, having somebody come in and help already compared to waiting till you really do need that assisted living level care. Those are things to come in and visit some of the appointments that we've set aside. Because the VA backlog is so extreme right now, we've gone ahead and set forth seven extra appointments that you can come into and actually see one of the members of our legal team completely free of charge, talk through you, your parents, your loved one's situation to make sure that you at least have a plan going forward. It doesn't mean that you have to trigger this right away, but you need to plan for it just in case. Because like we talked about, with a year possible before you get your claim approved or the issue that if you transfer things inappropriately, it can cause these huge penalty periods now, we wanna make sure you're doing things right. The VA has amazing programs, but access to them is always something that they've struggled with. And we want to make sure that you guys have the right route in order to be able to get those benefits quickly. Appreciate you joining us today on our live. We're going to go through a couple questions that have come in. And again, if you have any kind of topics for future lives, every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we'll go ahead and roll them out. What kind of questions do we have today? 
We, um, someone would like to know what kind of documents they need to apply for VA aid and attendance. Great question. One of the things that most people struggle with, and I apologize that I feel like I have like a curse of knowledge or it feels easier to me because we do so many of these, is that the forms themselves are very standardized. The form for the application is what's called a 21P-534EZ or a 21P-527EZ, depending on whether or not you're going for survivor's benefits or whether or not the veteran themselves is making a claim. Along with that, one of the big changes since October of 2018 is that you need to fill out an 0969 form, which is a more in-depth form about income and assets and talks a little bit more specifically about what the veteran or the family couple has. Remember that whenever we talk about federal benefits like veterans benefits, assets in the name of a wife or the name of a husband are going to be commingled together. You can't just say the husband has less than 129000 and then the wife has this huge nest egg somewhere. They're going to look at it as a couple always. Then there's going to be a doctor's form. And so that's called a 21-2680. It's a three-page form. You fill out the first page. And then on the second page, the doctor does an evaluation that says whether or not the claimant needs help with those activities of daily living. They fill in a little bit of extra information on the third page, and then it does have to be an actual medical doctor that signs that to be able to qualify as far as medical need. Then you need some kind of proof of the actual care costs. So remember, we said that a trigger was that they have to be paying for care. And so on the back of those EZ forms, there's a couple sheets where either a community or a caregiver needs to fill out what those care costs are. We highly suggest that you support those numbers with statements, checks, things like that to make the process faster. You also need to include a recent bank statement as well as anything about income, so the Social Security award letter that comes out every year, anything from the pensions, anything that you put on those forms as far as a number needs to be supported with some kind of documentation. It makes the process go faster. One of the biggest hiccups for people that try and do this on their own is that they fill out the forms. The forms don't have very clear instructions and don't ask you for individual things. Like they don't say, I need your checking account statement. I don't need your CD statement. They don't ask specifically for things like that. And since they don't ask specifically, people don't send them in. Then whenever the VA is reviewing the application, they send you a letter. They don't generally call you for anything. They send you a letter, and because they send you that letter, by the time you get the letter, you give them back what they want, and then they process that mail again, you've really extended the process for another 60, sometimes 90 days, compared to what it could have been. And remember that every month, whenever we're waiting on this, we have some kind of shortfall from care costs. And so if we have this process drag on for a long time, it can really cause some financial stress. The good news is that from the date that you apply, the next first of the month, so today is not the first of September, it's after that. So we've already missed September's first deadline for applications. So the next applicable date would be October 1st, and they'll pay retroactively to that date, even if it takes nine months or a year to get approved. And that's pretty exciting. One of the caveats is that the veteran does need to stay alive. And so this is a program designed for ongoing care costs, there is kind of a gotcha in there that if the veteran passes during this time frame, at that point in time, you'd have to reapply under the surviving spouse or you do lose the benefit. Any other questions from today? No, that's all we've got. All right. Well, we definitely appreciate you guys logging in. If there's anything we can do to help you, again, give us a call, 678-250-9355, or shoot us a message, and we'll be glad to get you in for one of our seven set-aside appointments for this. Again, it's a little different than a normal consultation that we do because it does dive into what you and your family need to be doing to better prepare yourselves to qualify for this benefit. Oh, Thanks we have so one much. more question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Brenda just chimed in. She said, uh, we found out about a year ago her father, who is 88, is a Korean War veteran eligible for benefit because of his hearing loss. He's had a loss for many, many years before we were told about it. So we're wondering where we may be able to see if he's eligible for any other helpful benefits. Yeah, and I think this is what a lot of people struggle with. So like we talked about, with the non-service connected disability, most people aren't aware that it exists. Only about 5 to 15%, depending on which guesstimate you kind of fall for there. 
even know that this benefit exists. So if he's eligible for benefits based on that hearing disability, that's going to be a service-connected disability, something saying that he lost his hearing because of what he did for his country. That does mean that his service is through the right periods of time. You want to look at his discharge papers just to actually make sure. And so whenever you come in for that consultation, we'll ask for you to bring what's called a DD-214 with you. And that's just a discharge paper that summarizes his service and has the dates printed on there so that we can be able to check and make sure what benefits they're eligible for. If for some reason you have lost the ability to be able to get those forms, you can go to archives.gov slash veterans and make another request for them. Okay. <laughs> okay.